Hello, um, I'm talking today with Professor Steve Zhang. Um, Steve submitted a REF 2021 case study um, entitled Engaging with China, Informing Governments, Shaping Business Strategies and Enhancing Media Portrayal. Steve's research um, was based on his analysis of government documents and statements and news reports and scholarly articles. And he developed a framework for understanding Chinese foreign policy, a kind of um, a real politique, um, if you like, approach to, to um, party uh, Chinese government decisions around, specifically around Hong Kong and Taiwan and how this was governed by sort of party political interests in addition to or instead of ideology. So really interesting research and got a lot of traction. Um, Steve, over the course of several years um, before SOAS and obviously during, uh, uh, particularly when he joined SOAS, started to engage with governments um, on some of his interesting ideas around um, foreign policy of China, particularly the UK government by the FCDO or the F FCO, as it was back then, um, and uh, foreign affairs committees, um, and also the governments of Canada, New Zealand, and Taiwan. Steve has also advised um, large multinational corporations with Chinese interests, for example, Shell and HSBC, and has um, reached an incredible number of people uh, through engagement with film and documentary makers for the BBC, Channel 4 and others internationally, reaching almost four, four million more, I'm sure, viewers and listeners uh, on, on really key um, uh, TV programs and radio programs. So I'm really pleased to be talking to Steve today. Um, Steve, is that a fair summary of your impact case study? Yes, I think it's an excellent summary of the impact case studies. I do have to say that um, luck has a lot to do with it. It <laughs> is more than just sort of completely by design and it all works exactly as I had intended. I wish I had such foresight and a master plan. Reality is that I didn't really. A bit of luck I got see. me to where I was. I see. So there was no master planning. There was no mastermind. It was more of an ev evolution of your relationships and research interests. I think there is an element that um, the the kind of research I was do I was doing um, would be and could be useful. I was mindful of that. And I was also, if you like, in a fortunate position that I joined SOAS as director of the SOAS China Institute. And the remit of my job was a lot of engagement. Um, the Institute was meant to be, if you like, an overarching institution within SOAS, representing SOAS for China studies generally. So um, from the get-go, my work would require me to think about how I would be able to reach out to uh, audiences outside of academia, for which therefore one you think immediately of impact. Mm -hmm. And then one would also be thinking in terms of the different types of uh, institutions or people who could be reached out for, for this purpose. So the logical thing would be that you have the uh, government sector, you have the private sector, and you have the more like general public. That's fascinating. In terms of then sort of maybe going back a step before we look at those relationships uh, and the and the outreach of the uh, the key outreach of the Institute is maybe a quick kind of um, exploration of your the political and social context of the, your, your research. I know obviously it's been a long standing project. Um, your framework consultative Leninism was developed. Uh, you know, more than a decade ago, and you have kind of um, elaborated on this as new, and I mean, China has a very fast moving foreign policy base. So obviously, you've had to kind of re-engage with the framework itself. But how difficult has it been to do so from a China Institute based in London? And what, what um, or has it been actually better to have this distance um, so that you can have a broader overview? Um, uh, how has that sort of impacted on on the research climate of your of your work? 
I think being at uh, SOAS in central London certainly helps. And from the get-go, thinking about impact, thinking about the kind of issues that uh, governments, NGOs, private sector, and others would need to know also helped. Because, I mean, this here applies, I think, in particular to governments. China has been rising in the last decade very noticeably and is clearly changing the world. So governments need to have a better way to understand how the Chinese make decisions in terms of foreign policy or relationship with the rest of the world more generally. And it was very much with that in mind that I thought there really would be a need for a user-friendly analytical framework that could be used not only for academic discourse, but for practitioners, for um, governments that make policy dealing with China, for them to use, use that framework in their everyday policy making or engagement with China. Hence, I designed it, this um, party state realism analytical framework. And obviously, for something like that, it has to be intellectually robust, vigorous as a piece of research, that it takes the boxes for colleagues in international relations to see it as something that um, they would approve of, otherwise you simply won't get it published. And it is also something that um, one is very mindful of the need of the RAF generally. Um, you need outputs that are well regarded, as well as outputs that can have uh, impact. And for the purpose of the RAF, I thought the article fit in rather well. And with a bit of luck, it turned out, I hope, to be the case. Excellent. Excellent. So I, I wanted to pick up on the thread of utility. You mentioned, you know, you being in London and a kind of seat of power in terms of uh, international engagement, you know, a key hub of international engagement with, with Chinese foreign policy in London and how that sort of shaped your, um, maybe, uh, you know, there's the rigour of your analytical framework and then the engagement with it. So, so being in London obviously shapes that engagement with it. And so how did relationships with the FCDO, then the FCO, but the FCDO now, um, the Foreign Affairs Committee, how did these relationships start you know where, where, what was the starting point for these um <laughs> quite important discussions well i think that really kind of goes back to uh before i joined soas um before soas i was um at the university of nottingham where i was head of the school of contemporary chinese studies and before that their director of their china policy institute so in my previous job I already engage with um, the government in London in particular and some other foreign governments. Uh, being relocated to London at SOAS, it just makes everything so much easier in terms of that um, engagement with them. Mm. So there was something that I was building up on. Um, to be honest, the previous round of RAF, um, I also submitted an impact case studies, which was building a, a lot around um, the kind of engagement I had with governments and international NGOs. I mean, there wasn't really much of any contact with the corporate world in the previous case in Nottingham. Um, the engagement with the corporate world was something that was completely new and designed and devised and developed after I joined SOAS. But that is very much because of the uh, central London location. Mm -hmm. I got here and then um, renew some friendships and acquaintanceships with friends in the corporate world, talk to them, ask them what they need. And it becomes clear that there was a bit of a niche 
So I came up with the concept of a corporate membership um, for those London-based companies to join the Southwest China Institute, in fact, for a fee. But in that process, there's also direct engagement with them where inputs could be provided to make them feel that they those inputs were useful and they would therefore uh, be willing when called upon to provide references to confirm that the inputs that I and colleagues at SOAS were able to provide were useful to them and therefore, in fact, delivered impact. I mean, bearing in mind that when we talk about impact, it is evidence-based impact. It's not just what I think we have impact, it is what the recipients are willing to say and acknowledge that, yes, you have provided inputs which have caused us to change something in what we do or plan to do or in our strategic thinking. And our corporate members were willing to confirm that. Yes, I know you, you received some brilliant testimonials, which we submitted as evidence uh, for the case study and, and really glowing, glowing, in glowing terms, um, your analysis, um, it was received by these people and these corporations. I wonder if it is for, for the engagements with the media and with documentary makers, with journalists and with, um, with, with filmmakers, you, 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 you tend to see the end result, you know, your analysis, your advice, and then even interviews to camera <laughs> and how it's edited and put together. You, you can obviously see how your research and your ana analytical framework has then um, been used by the filmmakers or the or journalists to kind of frame their outputs. So it seems very direct, if you like, and it may not be what, you know, what you envisioned at the beginning, but at least it's there very, very transparently. But then with um, uh, conversations and then, the, you know, advice through the membership scheme and also advice through select committees or, or, or co meetings with the FCO officials, it, is it, it's not as clear, obviously, these are opaque <laughs> processes of strategic development and policy making, right? So, so how, how do you balance those two things? You know, the, the, uh, the transparency of the media engagement, very direct, very transparent, and then the opacity of working with large corporations and, and governments, you know, it's, it's difficult, no, to, to keep motivated and to keep <laughs> re-engaging. Um, I think you are absolutely right to make the distinctions between the uh, media side of the engagement and the engagement with both the uh, corporate sector and the public government sectors. Um, in terms of the uh, private sector and the various governments, uh, my approach was really quite straightforward. Offer them the best advice there was on the most vigorous basis of research, um, rather than simply think what they want to hear and tell them what it was. Um, all the governments that I had been um, advising have their expertise on China. They do have fairly clear policies towards China, but they might not necessarily um, have all the insights that they really should have. And so by providing absolutely the uh, best independent assessments, I think it was more useful to them because they would be able to pick up uh, insights and ideas or challenges to what their thinkings are, which will therefore re uh, get require them or encourage them to make some elements of adjustment. Mm -hmm. And by offering them the uh, best advice possible, then they would also escalate. I mean, the reality is that particularly when we're dealing with governments, the initial contact would usually tend to be at very much the uh, working level. But then if they found the inputs really helpful, they escalate and they bring in more senior people. And for an impact case studies, by being able to 
uh, in some cases confirmed that very senior policymakers were at the receiving end of the advice would make the impact come across as more real. Um, so in that sense, more useful. I think the same also applies to uh, corporations. Uh, once they genuinely found your research and insights useful, they are more willing to confirm that it is very helpful. And I think um, one of the corporate members, for example, actually checked back with me to see whether the letter of reference should be signed by one of their senior ex executives or, or by the head of research. So they were quite willing and happy to do that. And obviously, um, in that case, I requested the reference to be signed off by their senior executive, um, because that would kind of provide an indication that it was being taken seriously at the senior management level, rather than simply at the working research analyst level. Now, in terms of the um, media side, I think the reality was that uh, most of the real impact were not in the very large number of news interviews. Um, the impacts were, I think, mostly based on the documentaries. But how do the documentary makers reach out to me? I mean, I couldn't possibly actually reach out to all the documentary makers because I don't know they were going to be making those documentaries anyway, and it would take a huge amount of uh, daily monitorings to be able to even locate that. So the approach I had was quite simply that um, as director of the SOAS China Institute with a remit to engage and being aware that several years ago uh, we were not sort of as well profiled in the media as we should be. I did spend a lot of time doing huge number of media interviews in order to raise our profile and therefore we become um, an institution that people who are making documentaries on China would want to bring up and check and say, I'm making a documentary on this, are you going to be able to help? And again, the reality is that not every single request I received, I, re I, I said, yes, there are things that I don't know. I think one has to be honest about that. Um, but there are others which I do know. And obviously, for those that I don't know, my uh, immediate follow-up thought would be, does anybody else at SOAS know? Can I get somebody else at SOAS, a colleague, who would be able to uh, help with that? And can that colleague be persuaded to do so? Not everybody would want to do that. Some would, some won't. But once you actually are out there and maintain that profile, then you get those um, documentary makers to come out and reach out to you and you work with them. And again, providing the best scholarship-based insights, which they may then find useful. That's fascinating. Uh, there's so many um, learnings, I think, for others as they listen to this, because it seems to me that just just summarizing both sides of this. So you've got your corporate and government approaches whereby over time and, to, you know, over the time that you've established your track record, um, you have uh, understood that actually working through the sort of day to day and analysts, <laughs> you then reach this more strategic decision makers. And there you have the significance of your impact, right, it is when you work through successfully and reach those strategic decision makers. And then, as you said, um, interviews are fine and they helped you establish a kind of profile uh, for the institute, which then allows you to, and uh, others in the institute and in SOAS, allows you to then engage with documentary makers where the really significant um, bits of analysis can be embedded into those cultural 
outputs and reach a, a quite a substantial audience. So all of these lessons and learnings for others, uh, they must have come at some, I mean, did you, are there dead ends or mistakes that you made on the way that you now would avoid? <laughs> are there any things that um, you, you think, think didn't work in, in the years that you've been engaging with these two forces? I think there are always areas where one can do better. I don't believe that we are perfect. We never are. Um, in terms of the kind of engagement, I think that two, in addition to just do your do the best kind of engagement based on scholarship, um, there is also an element of engagement in getting the references. Now, there are some countries, embassies whose references, in the end, we did not use for the uh, impact case studies. Um, we didn't use them for two reasons. One, we got enough from the others. Two, the ones that we don't use are not strong enough, or at least not as strong as the others that we in the end used. Well, they're not strong enough, partly because I think when I asked them for references, it, I was very general and gentle in asking for the references. Uh, I think there are a couple of embassies, for example, might have benefited from, from something that is perhaps um, slightly more detailed in terms of guidance of what really are needed. Um, we won't need that when we ask the FCDO for a reference because FCDO knows exactly what the ref is and what really um, are the critical things for them to mention that would be useful for the ref assessment. Now, some foreign embassies really don't get that. Now, some get that very, very well. I think there was one foreign embassy which wrote a what I thought was almost a, a model reference in terms of how um, um, they underlined the uh, advice that were being given were being taken seriously at very, very, very senior level, uh, ministerial level, and how it was useful. But there others just didn't quite get that and were uh, very generous in saying how much they uh, found me nice and helpful and all that. Now, that's not actually very helpful for the for the impact. Um, it's not about the individual being a nice guy, lovely, and all that. It is about what were being put into the system and how that could eventually uh, change their policies without giving specific details of how that change were uh, taking place. I mean, we are looking at pretty contemporary government policies. So there is a limit to how much details they can say. Mm -hmm. But if they were saying that, yes, this was being referred up to our uh, foreign minister and it has an impact on how we think about China, um, that's probably as far as you can hope to get in terms of a tes testimony from a government of what impact you have made. So we got some of them, and I think we probably could have got more of them. And if we have got more of them, we have better choices of what re um, references we could have used, and that could probably potentially have improved the eventual overall evaluation of the uh, impact. Um, there's probably always potentially a scope of how one can be a bit more strategic, but I would tend to think that um, that's easier said than done because trying to be very strategic in picking which ones to help and which one not to help uh, is gambling. I mean, some 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 of those that in the end turn out to be extremely helpful uh, in terms of the reference might not necessarily have been what you were thinking of at the starting point. So I think um, where possible, 
just be helpful with them and then see where you go. And for cases that you know is this is not going anywhere. <laughs> well, that's perhaps the point to being a bit strategic. Interesting. I, I, that's really interesting. Um, a lot of things to pick up there, including the fact that, you know, foreign embassies aren't as familiar with the ref and so need a guiding hand. And, you know, the circumspect <laughs> language that they use anyway is uh, is one of those things that you have to kind of navigate around and, and in reinterpret, I guess, within the case study itself. Um, I just wanted to ask my last question, which was really about you mentioned right at the top at the beginning, you know, uh, so much of this impact was unplanned and evolved naturally from the engagement via the Institute. Look at going forward and thinking about impacts in the future. What kind what kind of lessons have you learned from this period and that, what what in terms of what worked and what didn't or, or, you know, what was obvious and what isn't? Are there things that you would change? Are there things that you would plan for now in the next sort of five years in terms of the impact of yourself or the Institute? You know, absolutely. I mean, I joined SOAS at the end of 2016. And when I joined SOAS, even though there was a there was a uh, an understanding that SOAS would submit an area studies uh, submission for the RAF, um, it wasn't very clearly defined as to what that area studies submission would be. Um, it took a long time for that to be finalized. So. In my early stage, I really was just drawing on a lot of my previous experience in my previous university um, of an area studies submissions and what would be needed and just proceeded on the assumption that it probably would get picked up in due course. I think that was the wrong way of doing it. Um, the right ways to do it is that we now know we have defined very clearly what the area studies submission uh, for SOAS is. And in the uh, submission for the RAF, we have clearly outlined a plan for moving forward with area studies and we should stick to the plan. And we should also support and encourage impact case studies based on that plan so that we will not end up in a situation where uh, an impact case studies is there because somebody thought that it might potentially be useful was doing that, it turns out to be a good case to pick up to use. We really should have it very much an integral part of the way how we move forward. And, and for this, I think the regional institutes and centers can be very useful um, because it is, they are having the remit to engage with the outside world beyond academia, not excluding academia, but inclusive of academia and going beyond, which means that inherently there is scope for them to deliver impact. But if we change the regional institutes and centers into a different kinds of uh, institutions which result in them losing that remit, then we are going to pay a price potentially in terms of impact case studies. And I certainly see that the institutes themselves that lend themselves to engagement in the creative industries. I can see that documentary makers who would come through an institute to be able to gain access to experts like yourself. I can see that um, corporations, especially something like the membership scheme would then be avail uh, able to avail themselves of expertise in a way that makes sense to them. And so I, I can see that uh, what you're saying, Steve, is to deepen um, investment and um, resources towards the Institute so that these kinds of impacts can be um, deepened. 
Uh, well, thank you, uh, Steve, for um, th that brilliant um, um, analysis of the uh, of the of the engineering behind your um, impact case study. Um, for listeners, um, you can access uh, Steve's case study. Um, you will find the link to uh, the REF 2021 website, the results website, where you can download uh, Steve's case study and read it. Um, and uh, all that's left for me to do is to thank Steve again and uh, say goodbye. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you, Muta. It's been a great pleasure. <laughs> goodbye.